What if old school AppSec wrote aviation safety scripts? Hmm. Welcome to flight ASW-238. When the password sign illuminates, you must rotate your password. There are several emergency exits on this aircraft. Please take a few moments now to locate your nearest egress filter. In some cases, your nearest one may be denied. If there is a loss of cabin pressure, oxygen masks will drop down. To start the flow of oxygen, pull the mask towards you and submit a breathing review request. Although the bag does not inflate, your vol count will. In the event, unlikely event of a water landing, check beneath your seat for a top 10 list of swimming techniques. Thank you, and please be careful opening overhead CICD tools as contents may have shifted left. Which means, this week we chat with Def Moss about DEF CON, the intersection of people and technology, and the journey that conferences take from CFPs to codes of conduct. In the news segment, Microsoft forecasts unfriendly factions, Kubernetes gets an audit, Google gets a ghost token, AI gets more attention, and more. Prepare for takeoff and stay tuned for Application Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. It's the show to learn the latest tools, techniques, and processes necessary to understand DevOps, application security, and cloud security. Your trusted source for the latest application security news, it's time for Application Security Weekly. Imperva is the comprehensive digital security leader on a mission to help organizations protect their data and all paths to it. Only Imperva protects all digital experiences, from business logic to APIs, microservices, the data layer, and from vulnerable legacy environments to cloud-first organizations. With an integrated approach combining network, application, and data security, Imperva protects companies ranging from cloud-native startups to global multinationals with hybrid infrastructure. Start a free trial today and quickly protect your web app applications at securityweekly.com slash imperva. Business Security Weekly is recorded on Mondays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Each week, we address the challenges facing CISOs through our guest interviews, including former and active CISOs. Our news segment is focused on leadership and communication to better help security leaders translate and communicate security risks into business risks. Jason Albuquerque, Ben Carr, Tyler Robinson and others add their expertise to the conversation. I'm Matt Alderman, and I hope you search for Business Security Weekly in your favorite podcast catcher and subscribe to download our latest content. This is episode 238, recorded April 24th, 2023. I'm your pilot, Mike Shima, and I'm here with John Kinsella. Hello, John. Captain Mike, you just saved me some time. I'm still working on the news, and you mentioned one of the stories I was about to put in. So I'm like, oh, there's one less thing for me to do. <laughs> <laughs> one less thing off of our pre-flight checklist. Excellent, uh, Mr. Kinsella. We also have with us Jeff Moss, who's the founder of Black Hat and DEF CON. He currently serves on the CISA Cybersecurity Advisory Council, UK Gov Cybersecurity Advisory Board, Atlantic Council Cyber Statecraft Initiative, and the Council on Foreign Relations. His goal is to get hackers and researchers a seat at the policy table. He's interested in hacking, technology, privacy, security policy, and the intersection of civil society. Hello, Jeff. Thank you for joining us. Hey. You guys are a well-oiled machine. I think you've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've done this before, but not as many times as you've done DEF CON. We're coming up on the 30th anniversary, I believe, this June. 30 That's first. pretty amazing. 31st, and even better. Yeah. Wow. So in, we'd love to hear some of this journey, because one of the things I want to highlight to our listeners, which I'm pretty sure are familiar with DEF CON, but want to reinforce, is that... No, I think that that one of that initial announcements wasn't just to the hackers. You included the freaks, the techno rats, programmers, writers, activists, lawyers, philosophers, politicians, security officials, cyberpunks, musicians, and so on. You really hit much more than just you know that was people the, who are reading code. That was the Mondo two thousand, right? The twenty six hundred. It's like everybody that you could think of, you invited because you didn't know who was going to show up. And so I was reading that again recently and it's like techno rats right on. That sounds very, you know, eighties <laughs> and nineties. <laughs> People who still remember the screams of modems as they're sending bits yeah. to each other over phone lines. And I think, you know, that, that embrace of culture and how technology impacts culture, I think is one of the things that made DEF CON last for as long as it, it, it has been, as well as importance, because you were also working early on with EFF. You were working early on about the legal aspects of well, and the, the pre-CF. Yeah, mm -hmm. frustrating about that. In the early days, I think there were three groups. There's the CPSR, uh, Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility. There was, And then there was EFF. And then there was another one, uh, EPIC. 
and those privacy oriented. And now they all sort of disappeared and we're down to EFF. And so I, I worry sometimes that a, a diverse ecosystem uh, is kind of mm. it's concentrated into one. Don't get me wrong. I love the EFF, but why do we only have one? Only one is strange. And it's, yeah. and it's interesting to see that three to one because, you know, especially for the DEF CON journey, you've also gone from spot the Fed to, you know, someone from NSA keynoting. Uh, yeah. You know, th that's kind of an interesting journey too. Oh, if, yeah. I mean, there was a, um, one year at DEF CON, I think it was DEF CON four or five or something. And uh, people were hacking and they were sitting around the table and other teams came up and were starting to like write on notepads, like post-it notes, and they'd take notes over the shoulders of the players. And they were, I remember one guy was taking notes and he sticking the pads to his body, he just couldn't get rid of the notes fast enough. And he was trying to make uh, some observations on what the team was doing. Well, after the con was over, this guy came up to me and uh, he said, yes, you know, spot the Fed and everything. I'm with a uh, defense intelligence agency. I said, DIA, what are you doing here? You know, like, don't you guys count typewriters in Eastern Europe to see how much propaganda is <laughs> right. being produced or something? He said, well, I'm here trying to find out if other governments are trying to recruit hackers. I'm like, well, how do you do that? There's, look, there's like a room of hackers. What are you going to do? And he said, oh, no, no. What I do is I sit on the edge of the room and I look for other people looking at people. And I try to find out, can I watch the watchers? And I'm like, oh, so the guys with the notepads? He's like, yeah, I, I noticed them. <laughs> <laughs> so years, years later, when it's okay to sort of be a Fed and, and mm -hmm. everything kind of is out in the open, I'm giving a talk at this Air Force conference, and uh, and I tell that story. And afterward, that guy comes up and says, I can't believe you remembered that after 20 years. It was amazing. That's amazing. Still, what, a, yeah, yeah, what a small world, right? Still there, yeah. And, and it's that whole, you pointed it out, it's that flip-flop where... I think one of the things that, that uh, saved us is I sent faxes. Remember those? I faxed the field office for the FBI and the Secret Service in uh, Las Vegas telling them that we were coming because I knew they were going to come anyway. So you may as well just put it out in the open, right? And, uh, and they didn't attend because they said, oh, this is policy you're asking us about. We're an enforcement agency. You know, talk to people in D.C. But sure enough, they came. And at the end of the first year... One of the guys lifted up his shirt and said, oh, yeah, you know, I'm Secret Service. And I was like, oh, that's so amazing. <laughs> we didn't notice you, but next year we're going to be looking for you. <laughs> the game started, right? So. That is fun. And DEF CON is well known for games, well known for variety of talks. And I'm really curious, you know, what, what, what's... What, what inspired you? What was the model you brought in, in your mental model to think we want to have anyone, everyone from musicians to so on to, to respond to CFPs or be part of this? Because that's something that's, that's very yeah, different. Especially it's early. weird be because in the early days, um, the value sort of value proposition was there was so much misinformation um, in the early bulletin board days that w if you dug deep enough and found an expert, phone freaking hacker, whoever it was that knew what they were talking about, it was like you struck gold and you hung on every word they had and they knew what really, and then you talk to other people and they'd be repeating nonsense. Like there's this program supposedly that, that would protect you from having your phone call traced, the jammer, and you'd run the jammer and the jammer would dial a whole bunch of random digits on your modem, but they were claiming that it was dialing into some secret phone system, you know, turn off the recorders code. And uh, it's like, there's no way this could work. And all these hackers swore by the jammer. And then they'd go directly against their targets, thinking <laughs> that they were like protected. And it didn't matter how many times you told them like, this is nonsense, they wouldn't believe you. So the role of the first DEF CON was get the experts to talk to the hackers, right? Like, right from the horse's mouth. Because back then there were so many layers of text files and misinformation and conference call and voice bridges and VMBs, and everybody had to embellish it. And the truth was so far away from what was really happening. So that first one, we had like a virus writer, we had an attorney, we had a prosecutor, Gail Thackeray, who would, um, at that time was one of the most famous prosecutors because they prosecuted Operation Sun Devil, which was the first mass crackdown against uh, piracy sites. She was from Arizona. So she comes in 
And she's sitting there giving her talk, and in the audience is one of the hackers she's prosecuting. <laughs> <laughs> and so we just had this crazy environment of um, the first one we had Dan Farmer, who everybody mm-hmm. viewed as a god, right? Sun Microsystems, sure. before there were CSOs, he was the CSO. And uh, he was giving this talk about how he has so many systems now at Sun that he can't secure them all. And so he's thinking he's got to write some scripting language or he's got to come up with a way to automatically scan his machines and determine if they're vulnerable or not. And he's thinking maybe he'll call it something like Satan or security. <laughs> yes. aware, you know, And it gets him on the front page, the cover of Time Magazine the next year, right? With the first automated security scanner. And... Uh, and so I think those early successes with DEF CON made it so we were really content heavy. And so we had the content heavy talks and then we had all the shenanigans uh, and party kind of afterward. Because when you rent your space at the hotel, you rent it for 24 hours. And it felt like, well, I'm paying for the space. I got to do something with it. So we stayed up 24 hours and completely wrecked ourselves and learned <laughs> that, you know, try not to do that again. But people would sleep under the tables. Um, and so as the conference evolved, we always had this core of trying to have really good talks and uh, and then the social around it. And then over time, I'd like to say I was a genius, of, but it was really kind of the right place at the right time with the right friends that steered you correctly and told you not to do things you know wrong and stay on target. And um, a good conference, in my mind, is a balance of that social, the party, the social, mm-hmm. and the technical. And if one comes out of balance, then the conference feels wrong. And so that's why when you hear people complain about DEF CON, they say, oh, there's not enough technical. There's not enough social. Um, you know, oh, the conference is what you make of it. It tells me I've got it calibrated pretty well. Um, no, indeed. And I'm curious, too. I definitely want to come around to that social aspect in a moment, but also want to talk about the presentations. Because, you know, you even giving presentations to, to Air Force and many others. Um, yeah. What speaks to you as technical topics today, or just perhaps better just said, engaging topics? How would someone, how how could someone best respond to a CFP for DEF CON? Yeah, so I would say that's definitely changed over the years. So in the early days, it was, um, you know, bring your best hacks kind of thing. Mm -hmm. There was no bug bounties. There was no coordinated vulnerability disclosure, responsible, whatever. There was none of that, right? You just came out and released your hacks. And then once the consequences started getting bigger and bigger, um, we started realizing, well, this is probably not a very responsible thing to do. We probably should think this through. And um, and then people started getting jobs and it started really impacting their careers. They could make their career if they gave a good talk, but it could break Mm -hmm. their career if they released a bug and they got sued, right? We had all these students from universities getting sued. We have, still to this day, we get intimidation from different manufacturers Mm -hmm. that will come and intimidate speakers and have them pull talks. Um, And so now what we focus on is, is it a hacker talk? There's an endless amount of InfoSec conferences now. Yay, you know, when we started Black Hat, um, not very many. Now there's an endless amount. And, uh, And yet they all continue to grow, which tells you there's like this insatiable thirst for this knowledge. And we haven't hit a top yet. We haven't hit a plateau yet because everything is still growing despite hundreds of InfoSec conferences. So there's no shortage of those. I think there's a shortage of hacking conferences. And I try to define the two differently. Like you go to an InfoSec show to sort of advance your career. Mm -hmm. Um, And it might be through professional social networking, but it might be through talks about SAP. But no hacker has SAP at home right? Nobody's got an Oracle cluster. Nobody has some of these really large $100,000 deployments. So it would be kind of unfair to have a hacking conference with talks about enterprise software that nobody in the audience can potentially own. Or if they did, they'd learn about it at an InfoSec conference. Mm -hmm. So what we try to focus on is you're an aspiring hacker, you're an experienced hacker. How do you convey that mindset, that that mentality. And it really crystallized for me. So I, I have a friend who's I got a business that does uh, penetration testing, like as many of us know friends who have those businesses. And I was talking to him and he said, oh no, I'm, I'm probably going to send my guys to, uh, to DEF CON this year instead of Black Hat. I said, oh, that doesn't make sense. Why wouldn't you send them, you know, this is your, your area. 
It's a black hat. And he said, oh, well, my guys are pretty good. And sending them to black hat and taking the training is like honing the knife edge a little bit sharper, right? They're already pretty sharp. I can get them a little bit sharper. But what I want to do is I want to send them to DEF CON to learn how to think. And I was like, oh, that had never occurred to me really that difference in mentality. And once that really sunk in years ago, we've really been focusing on, is it a hacker talk? Does it inspire you? Does it teach you the thought process? Yeah. Does it make you want to go out and change the world? Does it make you want to go understand something new? Um, does it give you joy? Does it inspire you, right? Um, your InfoSec job might not exist to inspire you and give you joy. It's there to give you a paycheck and you know, put food on the table, different, different goals, mm -hmm. right? And so I think one sort of uh, feeds your bank account and one sort of feeds your soul maybe. And there, you need both. Um, and you absolutely so, do. Yeah, and I want to say too that, that I think that's why we see like you have DJs, you have music there as well as, and not to sound dry, but a lot of the presentations have been impactful on policy, things like right to repair. How, how does, you know, here is something that that technology should change in a way, or we should be able to be have our curiosity not punished, perhaps well, not necessarily rewarded, but not punished, right? And I, that was that 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 sort of foray into policy was previously um, you'd get lawyers up on stage talking about mm. whatever the new thing is, and then um, a friend and I, a friend of mine, Jake, was on the phone with me, and uh, this is back when I was at uh, a different part of DHS, and. Uh, and the election, the 2016 election had happened, and uh, and he goes, you know, I bet these voting machines are totally insecure. I'm like, yeah, I, I bet they're insecure, too. We had a speaker back in the Alexis Park days, black box voting. Like, I'm sure these systems are bad. It's just there's all these NDAs, and you can't reverse them, and shrink wrap license, and, you know, too bad. And he's like, oh, man, that, you know, that's too bad. It would be great if we could. And while we're talking, I get on eBay. There's a machine, it's on eBay. Oh my God, I'm buying it right now. There's a different kind of machine. And I just start buying <laughs> on eBay every machine that I can find that has. And what had happened was, well, two things had happened. The year previously, the DMCA um, had been revised to allow hacking and a carve out for hacking critical election systems, election technology. So all of a sudden now it was legal to hack them and we had a safe harbor. And then the other weird thing is there was a storm somewhere on the East Coast or in the Midwest, and it crushed the ceiling of a warehouse, oh. put rain <laughs> into where this one county was storing the election machines. The insurance company came in and totaled everything. And instead of taking the election machines and throwing them in the garbage, they did the responsible thing and sent them to like a re-PC, right? A green recycler. So the green recycler gets all these machines that work. And he's just selling them to make money. And, uh, and somehow we find out that and somebody lists them on eBay and we start buying them. And then the word gets out. And then the manufacturer goes to them and says, you can't have our machine. And he says, okay, well, you can buy them back from me. Like, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> but you answer. have to decommission them, like format them. And he's like, oh, okay, well, how much will you pay me to format them? And they didn't want to pay him anything. So he kept selling machines. So we got our hands on them. And when we did that voting machine village, sort of our entry into sort of policy making unintentionally, it was what happens when hardware hackers take apart a voting machine? I'm sure it's old operating system, old technology. Nothing about it is going to be too hard. The unique thing was that nobody had ever seen one before. It was sort of like seeing alien technology, uh. right? And that gets everybody super excited. And, uh, and then you had these people from... Uh, different voting districts that have the machine, but their contract prevents them from looking in the machine. So they'd come and they'd show up with their camera and they're like, I can't do this to my own machines, but I'm going to stand over your shoulder and I'm going to take pictures. And they were super excited. And so we unintentionally crossed this, like crossing the beams of policy and hackers. And we did in two days, the first machine fell in something like five minutes. But we did something in two days that other researchers hadn't been able to do in a decade because of the exception, because of, you know, the skills, because of because a combination of things. And that got laws changed, right? Virginia changed their voting machines. Mm -hmm. Other countries changed how they do things. And, uh, and it kind of felt like cheating because to us it was fun. 
but it actually <laughs> turned out to have a lot of value to other people. And we didn't realize the value that hackers could bring to these other communities. And now that that opened our eyes, we're really starting to look around and right, like biohacking village has a whole new uh, push, right? There's a whole lot of medical safety. We are the cavalry's getting a lot more traction. And I think, I think there was sort of this mentality that we can do this. Um, one of the things too, that, you know, it, it sounds cliche, it takes a village, but that's absolutely yeah. what you've done with, with the different types of villages. The villages are also in, interesting to me and an impactful part of DEF CON because they're people. It's not just yeah. one yeah. person on stage talking and everyone listening. Yeah. And so you, and that's something that also changes, I think, over time from what the hundred or so people from the first DEF CON to yeah. uh, the pool chairs going into the pool, perhaps yeah. at uh, Alexis Park, to 30,000 people and taking over the venue where Black Hat was. Tell us a little bit about what that journey looks like to go from 100 people to 30,000 people. Yeah, in that, in that transition from content of one to many on a stage to hands-on, you're around your peers picking locks, right? Mm -hmm. Like one of the very first villages, the hardware hacking village, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then there's a Wi-Fi hacking village and a lock picking village. And they really became the core of this idea of getting together with your friends and teaching by hands-on. And that was such a powerful change. And um, it wasn't accidental, but it was sort of, if those, if those groups hadn't brought all their gear to the show, it never would have taken off. And as soon as everybody saw it working, they're like, oh, we can do that too, from car hacking to, to you know, 30 plus villages. And, um, and what that's done is back to your human side is you can go to a big 30,000 person show. Our largest show has actually been about 27,000, but okay, 30 is a nice round oh, number. I will round up. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so you go there and you're like, it's huge. I'm lost in a sea of people. And then we've designed it such that, okay, but now I'm in this room and there's all these villages, but now I'm at, a, I'm at the lock thing. Oh, but now I'm at a table with 10 people and somebody's teaching mm. me how to pick a lock. Yeah. So you can go from 30,000 to 10, right? When we try to create all these off ramps and all these ways for you to find the people that you might be interested in. And sometimes they end up talking about, you know, analog synthesizers in the hallway at one in the morning. Yes. And sometimes yeah. it's, you know, hardware hacking. Uh, and so we try to always think about who are we platforming? Like, who are we giving a stage <sighs> to? And, uh, and Jericho years ago coined this thing that says DEF CON is a conference of conferences. It's like a meta conference. And so when you start thinking about that, you, your job isn't to create all the content. Your job is to really create a, a, an environment, a collaborative environment where other people have the opportunity to do what they like. And they don't have to worry about union contracts and projectors and all of that. They just have to bring their cool stuff and show off the cool stuff. And we'll try to figure everything else out to make it happen. And that seems to be a winning, a winning formula, right? People really respond and we have a lot of churn. We have villages that come and go, people mm -hmm. get sick, or people move on to other careers. And we just, we were always concerned what happens if one of these big villages goes away and it turns out, oh, there's like five villages behind them waiting to try because everybody is so inspired and wants to do something new. Um, and that's also the vibrant, vibrant thing about this community that I love, whether it's, you know, InfoSec continuing to boom or, or the hacking culture. Um, the other thing we find is the hackers are changed themselves, right? It used to be just a hardcore kernel or network. And now it's, it's it, it's in everything, right? It's from IoT to embedded to real time RTOS to whatever it is. And what's more interesting is hackers. The hacking mentality, like you, um, game recognizes game, like hackers recognize hackers. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you're a legal <laughs> hacker or you know a CTF gamer. Like the the they love talking to each other. So yeah, what are you passionate about? Tell me what you, yeah, to teach me that type of thing. One of the things that's got to be surprising, or maybe surprising for you, is that um, you've got a lot more people now. After the, there's got to be some point, maybe it's a hundred people, maybe it's a thousand, maybe it's ten thousand. But you do need to start to make sure that people do continue to. I'll just say behave. People yeah, continue yeah. just to be nice to each other, be excellent to each other, to, to yeah. use the, the Bill and Ted. So we've got codes of conduct, for example. Right. That's something that you know we have moderation on social media, 
but you've also, one of the conferences, moderation of people. How has that how, how has that changed and not harshed the vibe, for lack of a better yeah, word, so you know, that this it, stays good villages? I'd like to – I mean, for me, hacking was a very white thing, right? Everybody I knew in well, – I grew up in the Bay Area and then up in Seattle. Everybody was white except maybe one person. Everybody was male except maybe for a handful of, of mm-hmm. women hackers. Um, but when you're really young like that, 13, 14, 15 years old, you don't realize – what's happening. It's just, that's the environment you're in. Um, and so then you start throwing DEF CON and it's still the same environment pretty much. And then over time, as it goes from a hobby to a career, um, and people are now getting into the space because it's a job, all of a sudden, all different kinds of people start showing up, right? There's more women, there's more ethnicities, there's more people from other countries speaking with different accents, different languages you're hearing in the hallways. And as that uh, evolved, you realize, well, my, I'm kind of out of out of my element in some of those areas when people start um, uh, having kind of code of conduct complaints. We didn't have a code of conduct. Mm-hmm. Oh, we had one, it was, it was called, don't be a dick. And, and if it looked like anybody was misbehaving, we'd throw them out. But it was really, you know, ad hoc. And it was mostly based around you're too drunk, you're you're kicked out. Sure. It wasn't anything more sophisticated than that. And then over time, we have these uh, we have the DEF CON forums that have been around for 20 something years. Well, we started having to moderate the forums. And over decades of moderating the forums, we had to hone our skills and then we had to get our goons uh, to be a little bit more. Uh, familiar with like sort of like an online edge lords there's people who specialize in doing that sort of in person they figure out the edge they figure out just how many buttons they can push to piss you off or to follow you around the conference space or be creepy but just to have enough plausible deniability to get away with it right it's like the in life person of like the edge lord the rules and, lawyer yeah yeah it's miserable and so but once you figure that out and you know what to look for, you can spot them, and then you can boot them. But it's one of those things, until somebody tells you about it, until you really walk in someone else's shoes, you don't really realize that those people are out there. Because you like to think everybody's like you, but not so much. And so then we formalized our um, our policy from don't be a dick to we actually wrote down some rules and got some lawyers involved. And, uh, and that's the other thing with the growing up of DEF CON is lawyers. <laughs> you know, in contracts and negotiations and, um, yeah, it's like, you know, you're a real business when, when you have, um, bookkeepers and lawyers. And so with a code of conduct, there's people who rule lawyer that too, and they try to figure out how to weasel around it. And so you have to have a general enough code of conduct to allow you to capture the kinds of behavior you don't want. And so I, I always believe that it's better to, to dictate like no bigotry, no racism, no white supremacy. But if you start enumerating exactly what no bigotry looks like or exactly what you think white supremacy looks like, then people will create 10 different rules around it, right? That's our hacking culture. They're gonna game the system. Um, and that turns out to be super toxic. Because now you're arguing about whether or not a Nazi Absolutely. salute is really a white supremacy symbol. or, um, And it's easier just to say, you know what, here's your money back, leave. Um, it's not worth it, right? Um, and it turns out with a little bit of moderation, a lot more people want to attend. Um, and a lot more people feel safe. Uh, and it's not that they feel like they're being silenced or they're being uh, censored. It's more like, oh, look, somebody's trying to create a, an environment for us to get together and talk about hacking. We're not here to solve free speech issues or, you know, rewrite the constitution. We're here to have, you know, a good time. And, uh, and that's been quite a, an, an, a journey, um, for us to realize that little changes we can make through policies can actually really, uh, inspire people to feel welcome. So. Yeah, and it takes active effort to make f- people welcome to 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 put put actions to words rather than yeah, just say we'll be transparent about it. You are and show. Well, and, and so you have to. It's really hard because nobody likes admitting when you make mistakes. I don't 
like many want to make mistakes, but you have to. It's sort of like, does the code run? Well, the code's not running. So whatever you want to tell yourself, but the code's not running. And so it's sort of the same thing. If the conference thing isn't working, then you probably need to change something, right? You can't talk yourself out of that. And so um, when we came up with our code of conduct, the next step was, well, now you need a transparency report. Because if you have a code of conduct, but you never tell anybody that you're enforcing it, do you really have a code of conduct? Right? So if you can't hold yourself accountable, so then we were the first conference to do this transparency report. And you know the first couple of years you release the numbers, it's going to look terrible. Like how many stalking incidents or people get kicked mm -hmm. out for being drunk and disorderly. But there's no baseline because there's nobody else reporting numbers. And we're hoping by doing that, we're going to other people would follow our lead. And then everybody could see that how big is the problem? How do we go about fixing this problem if if it's a, if it is a problem? Um, well, so now that you've got this accountability cycle going on, the next thing is now you have to enforce it. Um, and so that's really where it came down to, um, or, or do you really believe in these uh, in, in what you have in your code of conduct? And so when we were sued um, for enforcing our code of conduct, do you settle or do you fight? And, um, and we chose to fight because that's sort of like the ultimate culmination. You have a code of conduct, you have a transparency report, somebody tests it, now you have to fight. And if you don't, everything that you did was kind of for naught. Um, and, and then what does the community believe that you stand for? Um, yeah, and, and clearly a very good fight too. Well, you know what's sort of interesting about that too is, you know, just thinking through this, this last 25 minutes of, of the story you've told about DEF CON, almost from the beginning we've been talking about legal, and now it's coming a full circle back around. So it's like you, you know, sort of, it wasn't a legal hacking conference initially, but like it was obviously <laughs> fairly, fairly um, um, a core to what was going on. And now I don't want to say you're using that to defend, but it, it's no matter what you're doing, you're still sort of very close to that um, set of rules or requirement for rules for us to get along. Yeah, and, and in the early days, it was you never talked about policy or the law or anything. Hacking was hacking, yeah. right? Keep all the government people at bay. Keep all the policy yeah. people at bay. They don't know what we're doing. Um, they'll just make it worse. But now, you know, decades go by, and that's why I think with the success of the voting village, like we hackers, we really need to have a seat at the table because the decisions are going to be made. And boy, if they're getting made, I want our community to be present. And we're not going to get it right 100% of the time, but we need to be present because if we're not, somebody else is. And uh, and that's been, that's been kind of a hard pill to swallow to admit <laughs> that um, that hacking is political, right? It was always like, oh, it's apolitical. Oh, hacking is the, or information security, if you look in, at least in the US government, it's during the Trump years, it wasn't politicized. It was its own thing, right? And everybody sort of views information security as a separate entity, a separate endeavor. But if you look at it, it's, you're making trade-offs, you're making ethical choices. You know, how much do you protect this at-risk community with, say, better email authentication? Or how much do you spend in authorization to determine if somebody's attacking you from Iran or whatever it is, right? Everything is a has a political component. And so last couple of years, I've been more vocal about saying, you know, hacking and security is political. And if we can digest that and accept it, I think we'll have a lot more success. But burying your head in the sand and pretending that, no, what you do every day at the hyperscaler has no impact politically... Uh, you know, that's, I don't think that's realistic anymore. Maybe when we're no. all in our own houses on single systems, but not in a hyper-connected world. Absolutely. And you've mentioned too, the, the DEF CON goons, this is the, 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 the volunteers, the security staff that just helps in real life people yeah. and people can volunteer to, to participate with DEF CON. Um, I'm curious, tell us a bit more either on the both aspects of being a goon, as well mm -hmm. as how could someone take that step towards that policy path as well. Yeah, yeah. so two things. One is, um, you know, it takes almost over 2,000 people to do the SHUT conference, right? So we have oh, closer to 2,500 people 
that for their contest organizers, village organizers, mm-hmm. um, events organizers, get together, you know, toxic barbecue, whatever it is, DJs, artists, um, and then goons, almost 2,500 people. Um, and so for everybody, it's pretty much a, it's a, an endeavor of, of love, right? They're, this is their passion. They, they're, they're doing this not because it's going to make them famous, but because they like seeing their friends. They like like doing this. And so um, the goons, the red shirt goons, um, you know, are a pretty tight-knit group. A lot of people have been doing this for quite a while. And, uh, and you, you can switch between dif- different departments. Um, we have about 15 departments from press coordination to info booth to um, dispatch. We have run our own encrypted radio network. Um, so there's all different kinds of front facing, rear facing, you know, the network infrastructure team. And, uh, and they all generally, the same theory I have with the uh, conference of giving people stages, the departments are pretty autonomous. And we provide them support and we provide them guidance and legal and, you know, and all of that. But there's, there's too many, there's too much going on to micromanage, right? So you have to pick a good team and support them and give them the room to fail and learn on their own. Because, you know, I, I, DEF CON's a virtual business and we have people all over, um, and I don't care when you do your work, do your work in the middle of the night. I don't care as long as the work gets done, because the conference business is a little different than, than most others. And that if you're a day late, the show's done. Doesn't matter. Already happened, right? Plane took off. So <laughs> yes. there's like, uh, the show must go on, right? There are these hard deadlines. And if you can meet the hard deadlines, I don't care how you meet it, because the only measure of success is did people show up in Vegas and have a great time and did it work? Other than that, I don't care what clothing you're wearing or where you're living, right? Like the show has to happen. And um, and it, it's a certain amount of freedom, right? And creativity that you can you can inspire with people then when they don't have this sort of nine to five um, stricture. Anyway, um, so I completely forget where we're going with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take, take us uh, so people can should be looking forward to being inspired by DEF CON, DEF CON presentations. And you've been trying to inspire people to get oh. onto the policy path. So I'm yeah. curious there too. Like, what are, what are some good early steps? Yeah, yeah. So the policy thing is pretty interesting. So in, what was happening is people from uh, DC and some other countries, um, representatives or their staffers or people from think tanks, started showing up and trying to learn what's going on at DEF CON. And we'd sort of walk them around and we had this p- policy section as a room and we'd sort of, there's a group of people who talked to them and explain what DEF CON was. Some speakers would come in and talk about their research if it was really cool. And we did that for a number of years and it sort of felt like um, everything that could be done, uh, could be transferred in that format had been transferred. Like um, it almost felt like Certain people were coming to see DEF CON to see the blue-haired hackers. This was like their tourism trip to see, you know, summer camp hackers. And in reverse, it was sort of the same thing from the hackers. It was sort of like what we call policy tourism. Oh, I was talking to the policy person and I got to, you know, hear five buzzwords. But nothing really <laughs> substantial was occurring um, from it. And so a couple years ago, we decided to reinvent um, the policy, make it more main stage, integrate it more into the conference. And last year was the first year that we really did this. How do you have meaningful interactions? How do you allow the two sides to get beyond the, I'm here as a tourist to like, what do you want out of this? You know, you go to the AI village and you're a policymaker, what do you want to learn? And so instead now it's much more about trying to match up policy folks, interest in policy, with the villages, with the aerospace village, with the satellite hacking folks. So instead of just kind of wandering around aimlessly, it's like, I'm here, I'm interested in aviation security. Ah, we have a village for that. Go talk to these people and we can make those connections. And then they walk away having a great time and a handful of business cards and connections that our old format didn't allow for that. Um, And so now we are trying to create all these on-ramps of, do you want to be a policy tourist? Well, maybe that will lead you to the next step. Um, One of the biggest shortcomings that that we can identify is that there is no easy way to bring hackers into policy. It's super frustrating because they get excited and then they say, great, what do I do next? And they're like, "Ah, comment on an RFC. 
Um, go to an ICANN meeting. Uh, comment <laughs> in an IETF draft. Uh, hover around the you know the Department of Commerce waiting for a request for feedback. You know it feels totally uh, unsatisfying. And so we've started to, uh, we've created a policy section on the DEF CON forums and we're starting to post some policy jobs. But what we're trying to do is how do we build some energy around how can people contribute? Um, and right now we're not very good at it. So I would say over the next bunch of years is we're really going to try to figure out how do we create those on ramps. And it's in both directions, right? Policy people in an area, this generally what happens is they have unlimited amounts of briefs from industry that want them to pick the new whatever 5G standard. And they have an mm -hmm. endless supply from manufacturers, lobbyists. What they don't have is anything really from civil society that balances the two. So you have basically two different commercial interests battling and there's no civil society at the table. And the, the representatives are going to make a decision. They've got to make a decision. So by you not being there, civil society not being there, the decision generally goes one of two commercial directions. And so um, so a lot of times they reach out and they're like, I'm making a decision. How can I get a third opinion? Like, give me something I can use to help make me, uh, you know, have a better decision. Because they both sound great and I know I'm missing a voice, right? Um, yeah. So that's what we're hoping to do. So we're doing, we have this program now where we have like these off the record sessions at DEF CON in the evening. So maybe you can get some policy folks um, that can come and tell crazy war stories or, and they just don't have to worry that they're being recorded and, and everybody plays nice. It's just not a main stage talk, right? It's more intimate, yeah. and, uh, intimate. And, uh, and then we arrange some off the record dinners. So we try to get policy dinner uh, policymakers together in a dinner with other hackers and other security researchers who really want to make good connections so we're trying to attack it at different levels the one-on-one -on -one, the off the record we have policy villages here um and then we also have main stage talks so it's um we're learning as we're going i don't i don't know if there's anything we can really copy we've looked around to see you know see what other conferences are doing to try to imitate their policy program but you know, we haven't found anything yeah. to really imitate. No, it's, it's cool to see you forging new ground. And uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to make the decision to wrap up soon. Yeah. But um, I do want to make sure that what's 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 on the future for you? Like, what what what's on your mind? Where where can we we should be looking to see where where Jeff Moss is is headed? Yeah. So, well, two things. One is sort of business, which is um, we've launched at DEF CON. We have trainings. Last year was our first sort of uh, trial, just proof of concept. We did eight, eight or nine trainings on the Monday, Tuesday after the conference. And so this year we're expanding that. And uh, and we found interest in other countries who said, hey, bring some of your training to, to us. Oh, cool. So we're going to try to grow the training business. We hired our first person to manage, full-time to manage training. So we'll see where that goes. That's on the business side. And then on the personal side, um, like you mentioned at the beginning, I, I donate or I spend a lot of time um, on unpaid volunteer advising or trying to advise whoever will listen, right? So it's uh, Atlantic Council or CFR or, or DHS CISA. Um, it's the UK government. Um, I just, I'm trying to do some work uh, uh, for Singapore. And it turns out that the, a lot of people, a lot of governments are looking for connections or looking for you know good advice. And so I'd say, I'm gonna to try to be this year more of a connector, try to get more people involved and try to help create those on-ramps. Um, as I think long-term as a legacy for DEF CON, for Paul in the policy area, not representing industry or manufacturing, but representing sort of the hacking and the researcher community, I think that will have lasting impact beyond an awesome talk. Absolutely, I think that's that, that's the type of work that should be celebrated. So we're we're happy to be listening to the, that work too. Now we do always wrap up with our guests with a particular question. I was, you know, it's DefCon, so I normally would ask, "Is DefCon canceled?" But I think we can <laughs> laugh and skip over that one. Instead, let me ask you what we ask a lot of our guests to describe AppSec in three words. Um, developers being responsible. Oh, once again, interesting. We always we always get new and different ones. So I, I love that response. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to say thank you for joining us and giving us that 
quick history of of DEF CON, some of the insights on especially the, the civil society, the, the people aspect. It's really great to see that DEF CON not only embraced that from the beginning, but continues to pioneer and push on that, as you were saying, with, with how does policy affect day-to-day -day people, not just competing huge interests. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. It's been fun. It's my first time on your show and hopefully do it again sometime. We absolutely want to have you back, and uh, but we will give you a break to go do all that very busy work <laughs> advising people that uh, are running bigger things than we are. So thanks again, Jeff. Thanks again, John. Thank you to all of our listeners. We're going to take a quick break and we'll turn with news of the week.